In today's world, the pressure to successfully execute business critical programs is greater than ever. Failure is unthinkable, especially in the economic uncertainty facing all of us during this difficult time. My name is Harry Baldock, editor at Total Telecom, and today I'm joined by Mentor's chief executive, David Hilliard, to discuss some of the key factors that contribute to successful program execution. Uh, David, it's a pleasure to have you with me today. Good to be here, Harry. Well, my first question for you, David, is, is why do organisations drop the ball so often when it comes to program execution? So um, before I get into this, we, we know the cost of program delays and partial failures is too high industry wide. Uh, wouldn't it be good if every business critical program worked properly, uh, especially in a 5G world with new networks and IT systems where it's a new game and complexity has gone through the roof. Uh, dropping the ball is a metaphor for making a bit of a hash of the five key factors underpinning successful program execution. Uh, by way of analogy, if you drop a ball in rugby, typically it's because a player receives a bad pass, they aren't concentrating, their skill level isn't good enough, or they're under pressure from opposition players. And the team miss scoring opportunities, which could cost them a crucial championship game. On programs, uh, the five factors or balls, they get dropped for all the same reasons, not paying enough attention, skill and experience gaps and pressure. The five balls are alignment, program plans, program organization, suppliers and dependencies. They're all covered in a, our guide, don't drop the ball. So drop one or more of these and the odds are your program will fail. And in a 5G world, that will be an expensive business. Why does this happen? It happens because management teams tend to be populated with very strong and experienced functional specialists, marketing, technology, operations, and so on. And even if a program is strategically important to the future of the business, normal daily operations tend to dominate and sideline new programs. Although functional leaders are really good at what they do, sometimes expert, they don't usually have deep program management experience. So when people are hesitant about what to do in any situation, they tend to fall back on what psychologists call default biases or doubtful assumptions. That is, if you don't know what to do, just do the easiest thing or the thing you are used to doing because you feel confident in it. But this confidence sets up some risky blind spots on complex programs. People misjudge the risks of not nailing the five factors down. It's never malicious, it's an experience issue. Uh, but unless you've personally run a few business critical programs end to end, you'll always be prone to misjudging what could go wrong. Running a business critical program is not the same as running a function. It's a completely different game. There's a ton of other distractions from elsewhere. So getting enough management attention on a key program is always an issue. Even though functional leaders may be star performers in their functions, critical program leadership skills and experience won't be there. It's not their fault, but they don't know what they don't know, and it's hard for them to compensate for that. There are plenty of opportunities to drop the ball without really knowing or understanding why. So right there, uh, you have a recipe for a difficult and costly ride with lots of frustrations and detours for anywhere between 12 and 24 months, which is a typical program length. But it's all preventable by following a few simple disciplines. It's not very glamorous work and they just won't fall into place on their own. Uh, it takes hard work uh, and they're easy not to do. And the truth is many companies don't. So it, it sounds like star power alone isn't enough to really drive these, these programs through to completion. Why is executive alignment so important when it comes to successful program execution? I've been in many situations, Harry, where people get a little indignant when they're asked about program alignment. Uh, a typical quote would be, of course we're aligned. Uh, the six of us meet regularly to discuss the program and to fix problems. Well, that's good, but six isn't enough. What about the scores of people in and around the program who see other managers behaving at odds with the strategy? 
they get confused and they quickly start believing company politics is more important than alignment. In those sorts of organizations, the who is more important than the what. And trying to work in a political setting like this is a thankless and difficult task. So lack of alignment is a silent program killer. Its, uh, its effects are deeply corrosive. Everyone thinks they have it, but the evidence from most programs is pretty clear. They don't. Uh, you want everyone in the business to understand and act on the same message. If the message isn't strong enough, you get confusion all over the place and things fall apart pretty quickly. It helps to think of building alignment as a pyramid with five levels, with vision at the top. What's important is to unite people around the program vision. Uh, what opportunity are we trying to make the most of? What major business problem are we trying to solve? So dropping down a level in the pyramid, what's the program strategy? What do we need to do to succeed specifically? Drop down one more level, what tactics will we use? Who is going to do it? When and how? So down once again, what controls will we use to measure performance? So getting the program aligned around these five levels in the pyramid helps to get people moving in the same direction to achieve something meaningful. Most uh, conflicts are not over vision and strategy. They're over tactics. Who, when, how, it's interdepartmental stuff. It's much easier to get broad agreement around vision and strategy. If there's a conflict over tactics, it's worth bumping the discussion up a level to strategy to remind people what has to be done. And often you'll find agreement there. But without alignment, your program is over. Alignment isn't possible until everybody gets on the same page. The good news is building alignment is relatively straightforward if you take a rigorous and thoughtful approach to it. Again, it's hard work, but anyone can learn the skills. Using them takes practice. So you mentioned there the importance of really having everybody on the same page. Uh, how does that interplay with culture and how does culture play a part in the success of a program? There are many academic descriptions for company culture, but uh, simply put, uh, Culture is shaped by written policies and informal practice, and gradually this stuff merges over time to become a company culture. Perhaps a more useful definition is simply the way we do things around here. How do people behave? Which behaviors are tolerated and which aren't? Uh, do managers lead by email? Uh, what features aren't covered, covered by the employee handbook? Do people turn up early or late for meetings? What happens if they're late? Do people dress formally or casually? And a good one, uh, are discussions really frank and open? So as you'd expect, there are many subcultures in an organization. Marketing will be different from technology and so on. Each has their own rituals and behaviors, but consistent with the overall culture. But some features of a company's culture can affect people's behavior on programs. Is, if the company culture is can-do, uh, fear-driven, political, um, sales-centric, wild optimism, or uh, even indifferent, each one drives behavior that can be extremely damaging to any program. So for example, if, if leadership doesn't handle bad news well, uh, it creates tension. Uh, people will just clam up and withhold critical information for fear of humiliation, criticism, retaliation, and in some cases being removed from their job. If people are anxious and scared, they will always opt for self-preservation and bend the truth. No one wants to look bad. So cover-ups can become more ingenious each week as teams dream up new ways of spinning bad news. This is where what we call green shifting starts. Milestones that should be deep red because they're not under control are reported as green or, or going well. So facts are sometimes concealed for months on end 
lie band-aids on an open wound. Uh, no one can remember the truth anymore. What's intriguing is management's capacity to swallow misleading information and fairy stories for such a long time. Uh, in many high profile program post-mortems, the leadership frequently say uh, they were misled by the program team. Uh, so when the truth finally emerges, it's often too late. And instead of asking why this has happened, there's often a race to chew out the so-called culprits. Business critical programs are hard enough without having to filter out the sort of on factual facts that flow from either fear driven or over optimistic cultures. It's good to have a tough and challenging program set up, but not at the expense of frankness and openness. People must be encouraged to focus on the facts, not on stories that cover up bad news. Nothing tanks workplace culture faster than fear or over-optimism. It's a real drain on productivity and no one can afford the destructive chain reaction that follows rushing after on factual facts all across an organization. Management should expect to deal with problems and if people feel safe and supported, they will play a constructive role in solving problems faster. So rather than react, it's always smart to respond constructively, always remembering what everyone knows, uh, when emotion goes up, intelligence goes down. Great, so it sounds like there's a lot of potential stumbling blocks for companies uh, related to, to culture. Um, but in a more holistic sense, what can organizations do to get it right when it comes to program execution? First, um, you have to ask some basic questions like, have we ever done a business critical program like this before? Uh, how long ago uh, is the program director still with the company? What about the suppliers? Are they the same uh, this time around? Um, with new networks and IT systems already here, the chances are it's not exactly the same as the programs you've run before. And many people who were around a few years back may even have left the business. So answering these questions honestly will give you a good view of what you're in for. Beyond that, it's down to the basics we've described in our program management guide, uh, don't drop the ball. If you do a meticulous job on getting the five balls nailed, you have a very strong chance of running a successful program. It's not enough to tackle two or three, you could do a great job on three and still miss the mark. The truth is most companies do a poor job on all five balls. For example, alignment is usually cosmetic. Plans are not plans, they're targets and laced with uh, wishful thinking. Many programs are poorly led and, and in reality, they're organized to miss the mark, however, unintentionally. And if supplier plans are not well integrated with the main program, supplier can, contributions can be very tricky to manage. The program organization must be led by people who really know the ropes. Uh, don't over rely on uh, internal people or external people. Recognize what your company is strong on and recognize where you need help. If you needed heart surgery, you'd want to be operated on by someone who had successfully performed exactly your surgical procedure many times before. If it was a strategy gap, you wouldn't hesitate to bring in outside help. So why hang back over execution? Where the stakes are just as high, perhaps even higher. It's all about being pragmatic. It's all about balance. So think about the five balls as a five-way padlock. You have to open all five locks in the padlock to clear the path to execution success. Even with four, the padlock still remains shut. So spend lots of time building alignment, get pragmatic and gritty about program planning, use reliable planning metrics, put a tightly focused core team together to do the work with no distractions. 
And remember, the wrong people don't fit at all, no matter what their experience is. They gum up the works and damage the culture. The right ones bring a special harmony to the way things run. Manage your suppliers tightly and deal effectively with the huge interdependencies between projects. So the investment in doing all of this properly is time really well spent. And from experience, it's substantially cheaper than paying for a rescue situation further down the line that could easily run into millions. Many times, it's much, much more than you might imagine. Usain Bolt is an insanely talented athlete. He holds world records for the 100 meters and 200 meters, but he would be the first to admit he could not have achieved everything he did without a tightly focused, multi-skilled and cohesive team behind him. He knew what the balls were and he didn't drop any of them and he got it right when it really mattered. David, thank you for your time. Nice to meet you, Harry.